aim here is broadly, for those who haven't been here before, is broadly to create a space where we can discuss issues around labor, broadly understood, work, workers, poverty, unemployment, class, and the left. So it's also thinking about issues like engagement with Marxist theory, engagement with um, the political uh, traditions of the working class, and large issues around political economy. Okay, so it's really a space for that. Uh, we really try to create a space where students can participate a lot. So please, when we have Q&A later, don't just wait for all the props to just talk on and on. Okay. You can talk on and on too. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Sonwe Bile Mwana, who's Head of Department of Sociology at University of Fort Hare. Sonwe Bile was previously at WITS, and before that, he's actually at Rhodes, when Rhodes had an East London campus. At WITS, at WITS he was Director in Sociology of Work Program, SWAP, which is now the Sociology Work and Development Institute, which is really the leading institute dealing with industrial sociology in the country, I'd argue in the subcontinent. He's project leader for the Mineral Wealth and Politics of Distribution on the Platinum Belt Investigation. He's worked as a researcher for the Mineral and Rural Transformation in Southern Africa Project. Um, past president of the South African Sociological Association. Uh, he's published <coughs> Development Southern Africa, the Journal of Contemporary African Studies, Review of African Political Economy, South African Crown Courtly, South African Labour Bulletin, etc., etc. And a lot of his talk today has been published online now as a working paper in the MISTRA, Wapun Gubu Institute for Strategic Reflection mm. series. So we'll send that out as well to everybody. Okay. Without further ado, I would just like to hand over the floor. Prof is going to talk, uh, get through it, and then we'll take a couple of rounds of Q&A. We'll also circulate a register if you want to be added onto our mailing list. And if you're from sociology, you should also sign um, up. Okay, that you here. Can you hear me at the top there? I'll try to, to be uh, louder. <coughs> You see, I was a very uh, quiet, maybe soft-spoken person when I was younger. Then, unfortunately, my first career was in teaching. I started teaching at high school in the year 2000. Then my voice became louder. So I don't think you will have a, a problem now because you are speaking to a teacher or maybe a, a former High school teacher. Welcome everyone. My name is Sonwabi Lemnwana. For some perhaps reason, I like to um, say my name and pronounce it uh, so that people will at least learn to pronounce it as well. I try to, to do that, I, although at times I struggle to pronounce other people's names, but I work hard. Uh, colleagues, I'll be talking briefly on this topic, and uh, I'm glad you said you mentioned the word broadly, because like I've always been asking you whether it fits very well, this topic, to the issues that you raise in the study of, of labor. But of course, I think it does in a broad sense. Um, I'm trying to understand some of the findings of uh, the research which I think I began in 2007. I've been investigating the multiple impacts of platinum mining in rural communities in South Africa. Uh, I've started a number of case studies on the platinum belt, uh, case studies being that what, 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 what one can term the traditional authority areas, or what you can call them, the tribal authority areas. I'll explain why I used that term. You know, uh, maybe I should quickly do, because I, I do not necessarily mean that uh, the people in these spaces are tribal. But from what I've observed uh, over the past 20 years or so, increasingly, 
the state has ritualized those spaces and has demarcated the traditional authority areas using the same demarcations that apartheid used to establish the tribal authority areas. Right, I'm, I'm speaking briefly on the topic who owns the land, who owns platinum, conflict and contested meanings of land and mineral wealth in rural South Africa. Just a few issues I would like to highlight as a background. <clears throat> One is that we have what we could observe as a rural based expansion of mining. Remember, mining and rural were linked by one uh, factor, which some of you may know, the migrant labor system, you know, where uh, African males migrated from all over South Africa, long distances, and went under extremely difficult conditions, and were never fully provincialized. And I think some of you in the labor studies have read a lot about that, but I'm not about that now. But what has happened increasingly this is the mid um, 1990s is that platinum mining has expanded in these areas, particularly in the former Northwest and the Boko provinces. This is an old map of what used to, of, of what is called the Bushland complex. But if you see this map now, I think this is a 2008 map. But now there's more mining operations than you can see. I mean, you don't need to see. The, the names, but I mean, those are the operations of the name. But there's far more now. And remember, these are spaces that are highly uncontested. And where African people had been thrown in different historical moments, but it was some, during the time when Africans were most forcefully, uh, and during the time when the colonial and upper big states were creating the reserves, which became the tribal authority areas. And remember as well, some of you might know, the history that these are spaces that have experienced multiple layers of dispossession. <coughs> right. I mean, I'm not going to talk about the, the land acts which some of you are familiar with. You know, the land acts of 1930, 1936. You know, the group areas act, which although they had much impact in urban areas, but they did. In rural areas, the Africans were, were down in these spaces. I will talk about that. I want you to understand that context because what I'm going to talk about touches on that context. And these are the spaces that are where the state has re-labeled people in these areas as tribes. I'll argue that. Because, I mean, what is the difference between a traditional authority area or traditional authority and a tribal authority of the past? I find there's very little difference there, you know, except that there's um, legislation that, I mean, where the premier appoints the, 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 the traditional leader or chief and that the so-called real family, whatever. But basically, like, these are spaces that were designed to produce nothing except cheap, oscillating labor, and these spaces still produce that. Now, what happens when more and more land is the target for expansion of large-scale mining activity? We have witnessed, we have witnessed over the years significant dispossession of these, I mean, of rural residents, particularly plowing fields and even at times residential land, including rivers, diversion of rivers. There are multiple layers of dispossession because of my more, more and more land has been fenced off for mining. And quite, quite prominently, chips enter into complex deals with mining companies on behalf of the people because they are assumed custodians of rural I mean, you've seen how uh, the, team, the king of, of, of the Zulus has been very much again curious I mean, uh, about um, the threat to the Ingo Nyama uh, Trust Act because he believed that the land under his control belonged to the Zulus, uh, to people that are called Zulu. And, but on the ground, this is not by me, but other scholars have shown as well that uh, more, I mean, more and more people are losing land rights. When they are under the control, when, when those rights are given over to custodianship or traditional authority. Of course, this perpetuates the total neglect of 
the pre-colonial African land holding systems. Because there's a, this assumption, of course, Marx was a very much a very much a colonial of this. If you if you read some of his lectures, <coughs> if you have time to spare to, to read Trigger much in. <coughs> he, he spoke a lot about uh, an African being a perpetual child, that private property was not for Africans. And of course, this was very much supported by the social Darwinian scholars of the colonial era who promoted trusteeship of any property that was held by an African and grouping of Africans when it came to land rights, that Africans were mere community or groups. I'm not going to use other of term. And but when it came to property, they were not allowed to enter into any colonial land, uh, land markets. But I'm going to talk about the agency of Africans and, uh, and the forms in which resistance throughout time has, has taken. Now, even now, I mean, most of the land in these areas, I mean, even people would say that this is state land. You know, I mean, what, I mean, when people talk about what land is in the hands of black people today, you would hear people saying that all the land in, in, in the former homelands, that 15%, whatever, is, is in the hands of, that land is not in the hands of black people. That land is controlled, it is under the custodianship and control of the state. So, if any mining interest has, is targeting that particular land, people are removed. They have, their rights are very weak. You know, I mean, the state colludes with chips and uh, give them, and, and in fact, there's wrong in the, because there's no law in South Africa that says chiefs are custodians of land. There was a law that attempted to do that, the communal land was but it was thrown off to be unconstitutional. I think remember that some when we started that. So there's no such. The assumption that uh, chiefs control uh, rural, I mean, they control rural, 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 isn't there. But there's this perpetuation of custodianship of Africans not, not, not having any control on any form of property, whether it be heaven or whatever. I mean, you know. That even the out of the houses, there's a certain period of I mean, eight years, or seven years, that Africans who are so called beneficiaries, they're not owners of those properties, may not sell that land. So there's this condescending attitude. If, if, if any land is in the hands of Africans, and it's strangely enough, it continues under this if any, land, if any piece of land is under the, in the hands of Africans, then they, they're going to sell it out, they're going to sell it, they're going to squander, they're not going to be able to. To create wealth out of this way. There's that attitude. But now, what I'm looking at, basically, I'm looking at resistance and conflict over land and how it has taken place in these spaces. I draw on the case study of Bakata Bakapera uh, in the what used to be called the Pilani State region, north of Washington. Does anyone know where that place is? Yeah? You go to Sun City. Okay, okay. No, I'm just putting it away. But now, I mean, you were talking about that area under the bush first. And, right, uh, I mean, there's quite a lot that has been written on conflict and land. You know, I mean, and, and a lot of scholars have observed that, I mean, as there's a whole, there's what I call the scarcity. Thesis, that as land becomes scarce and the values increase, more and more conflicts and forms of inequalities are emerging and witnessed all over Africa, and uh, and also struggles over, over land. Uh, uh, in essence, a broader range of over property and uh, social relations over, over, over it, and power and legitimacy over land is also sanctioned by authority that, that govern land. I mean, the authorities that govern land, but you're not talking about rural land. In, in most parts of Africa, are regulated and defined and legitimized to what is called custom. You know, I mean, people say, I mean, we, we know quite a lot, maybe some of us, what is meant by customary land rights, you know, and how, for instance, those rights tend to be legitimized, I mean, <coughs> by what is called living customary law, but I, I don't want to, to go into detail about that. So the villages have observed it's a village of Mr. Ken. You know, can you see that? <coughs> the village of Sefiti. If you notice, there's mining operations 
next to each of the villages. And this is <coughs> map also. There's a number of I mean, it only shows four of our major operations, but there's many other operations throughout. You know, you found that next to people's uh, houses, there's huge open pit this side. Some of the land has been fenced off, the river is directed there. You know, I mean, it's, it's almost chaos. I mean, people are, are, are living under extremely difficult conditions, you know, uh, 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 during this, this era of, 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 of sorry, of expansion of flooding in these areas. Right. But key issues that emerge out of this. I want to understand, uh, first of all, how have meanings over land shifted at different historical moments? I argue that if you want to understand um, resistance, if you want to understand the contemporary conflict in South Africa over land rights, particularly in rural areas, you have to understand what means the people attached to land and, and, and resources. And I argue that meanings are not static. They change at different historical moments. I mean, this is the latter argument, which I will talk more about it today. But the paper that Lucien was referring to um, largely covers the first thesis. I mean, this is a series of, of papers that, I mean, two of them. But the first one covers that background, for instance, um, which argues basically that, although many studies report land-related conflicts across Africa, there have been limited attempts to narrow the empirical focus uh, into the processes that shape the structure of power at, at a level, uh, at, at the local level, and how these processes connect to, di to the contemporary distributive struggles. Now, I, I, I take the debate to, to historical and political economy level, I mean, in that, in that paper, which is going to be situated. I look carefully at different historical moments on how the power shifts. Well, I mean, we about it. I mean, why the chips are so strong? I'm not saying that it's such a nice species in that way. If people want chips, they should have chips. If people want to move well, they should have that. And that's what I'm debating about. I'm happy with that. You know, the democratic countries. But what I've observed is that there's resistance to control over property or control over land by these institutions at the local level. So some of those institutions. Because when we talk about land, we're not only talking about territory. Because land, I mean, you cannot just be uh, put into one land. I'll, I'll, I'll put into one land. <coughs> After that, what land are you talking about? Are we talking about residential plots? Are we talking about land fields? Because if you're going to then discern between these forms of rights, then you, you, you will notice that land was land rights were never crystallized at the level of traditional authority. I'm saying that if you are going to look through this, I mean, through this analysis, you find that land rights have never been at any historical level of crystallized. Once land was allocated to a social need, to a productive need, I mean, some, some, some of you would call it a feminist, no one could alienate those rights. I do not know any time, any historical material that would have been colonial era. Or even during, I mean, during the period, by and large, I do not know any instance where chiefs had power to, to remove families from mountains and to remove families from residential laws and to remove families from raising land. It was only due to the state policies that I'm mean, aware that she was colluded with the state when such things happened. Right? So now, that, that is the first one that I'm, I'm trying to make on, on that thing. So I ask you, losing the case of the heart. That you should look, look beyond the, 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 the local national politics where the chiefs and the state, the dominant narrative that the, the, the chiefs and the state collude and, and the state believe that chiefs can deliver rural votes. So that is why we have used that argument that the NC is part of the rural areas because there are two, I mean, I've also used that as well in the conversation, you know, because there are two uh, things that, that, that uh, the state doesn't want to mess up with. The chips and the social grants. You know, mess with the chips, they lose votes. Take away social grants, massive starvation in the, in, 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 
But now I'm looking at one locality, looking at the regional pattern. For instance, how certain chief jobs emerged, looking at the Bakada and, and the Bakugan and the Langa Mapela in, 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 in the Bobo, how these chieftains has emerged, you know, and to become very powerful in the regions that they were. So I look first in the in, in instance, I mean, in, during the period of group land mining. In Glasgow or in the so-called last language, where Africans post uh, the period of dispossession, bought their land in groups using cattle, using some of them who could get money, and I think. So what dates is this? This is the period after the 1950s. You know, this began effective in the 1960s in the Bahamas. You know, 1962, so 1862, sorry, sorry, not 1860s, 1860s. This is the period where the, the Transvaal Republic was there, was still fresh. Now, post, the, post that period, what you notice is a pattern where Africans would buy land, but they were never allowed, formally allowed to enter into these markets. But what used to happen is that because land, private property, was a preserve of, of what? They then negotiated with some of the white male intermediaries. So they would go, by and by, they would trust missionaries in those days. Although some of the missionaries were quite unscrupulous. <laughs> <laughs> so they would go to missionaries and, 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 and as a group and, and, and purchase them through this. And missionaries would, would do all they did, and do with the transfer, and meeting with the lawyers, collecting, collection. Of the money and other things that we use, selling the cattle, and then, then eventually, until I mean, this was it would take more than 10 years at times to get the land. But in most of the land, by the way, they purchased from the missionaries themselves. You know, at, at the times they were robbed. I mean, for instance, Paul Kruger would rob some of the groups of the within the Bakanda area himself, you know, and, uh, you know, some of them who, who, who was quite a powerful at the time, they owned most of the land. So he would rob them and say, No, you were right. You know, and, and keep them, and actually force them to work in these farms. You know, and then when they would not comply, he would say, well, even the farm you're buying over there, you, you're not buying that farm, you're renting it. So that was some of the process, and not so great to But many African groups in Milan, it's not Milan State now, managed to purchase, to secure this form of private property. But they, the title being reflected was the, the commission. But some of the missionaries then, uh, were willing to change I mean, the farms to the, to the titles, to the names of the farms. And now, this was now at the, at the time when, uh, in, the late, in the late 1890s, in the build up to uh, the Union. And, and of course, towards the war between the English and the Africans, that some of the land that was not it, after, I mean, the government allowed that the land that was purchased by Africans through this should be transferred to the Minister of Native Affairs or the Commission of Native Affairs, but still perpetuating this trusteeship. Now, that sort of impoverished Africans significantly, but now am, am I writing one issue in that country? How during this, I mean, this, this, this group land buying went on and on, I mean, during the 20th century now, in the build up to the land act, <coughs> after the land act, it still continued, but now it was the chiefs who were mediating this. And most of that land became tribal property and was held by the Minister of Native Affairs. But most of that land, all of that land now is held by the Minister of Rural Development and then Affairs. It's still tribal property. But what happened now when that land is targeted for money and what happened in the US? What happened in the US? It was a long time ago, in the 1980s, 1920s. But because of the global demand and trust and other factors, there was never any significant my uh, I mean, uh, I mean extraction of capital You know, I mean of course, I mean until the I would argue until the late 1960s. Although some of the mines started much earlier. Okay, I should highlight also one thing that most of the farms were also bought from white speculating companies. Because there was this right to speculate five minerals all over, particularly in the during the time when minerals were so-called discovered. 
But there's no such a thing as well as discovery of minerals. I repeat that. There's no such a thing as discovery of minerals. Because at the time, the so-called discovery of minerals was being discovered. Africans have long have been traded with gold. They have long I mean, used coal. They have long used iron. They have long, long used but, but these were moments of European realization and exploitation of African minerals. These were moments of European realization and exploitation of African, massive exploitation of African minerals. That was what was happening. Right. So, but now, what I, 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 I highlight here is that throughout the period, up deep into the 1950s now, from the, from the late, I mean, particularly from, from, from the late 1800s, ships became very prominent. But unless most of them were, they were missionary educated, they, they were organizing these good purchases for <coughs> themselves. And because, I mean, most of the buyers were, were not that educated, you know, although they were, they were wealthy farmers. They were, they were not that educated in the town, so I mean, they, they would still be kept to the ship. I mean, there were, there were many, if you go to the archives, there are many disputes <coughs> by some of the contributors to say the ships collected a number of cases, they never told how much cases was worth. And some of these cases went up to the High Court in Victoria, but most of those cases, all of those cases, in fact, I've not seen one case where I've been warned against the chief because it was said that. No individual or group of individuals can challenge a chief. The chief can account to his tribal council whatsoever. But the chiefs were very powerful inventor. This was created a particular um, uh, regional dynamic where, where particular chiefs became extremely powerful based mainly on <coughs> the, um, them being mediators of African entry to colonial land markets. So that, that, that's a, that, 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 that is the argument I make in that, in, in, in that paper, which sort of tries to go deeper into the question of how the dynamics of chiefly power could be, could be understood. So the mediation of mining deals by traditional authorities is nothing new. Um, I mean, there's a, 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 a long historical pattern, you know, and it is also not sufficient to say that the post-apartheid government has empowered chiefs through series of legislation. I mean, that is not sufficient to say. I mean, because the interpretation of legislation has led to chiefs becoming very powerful. But, for instance, if you look at the Bafugan chief and the Bahada chief, they're very powerful. I mean, uh, I mean, they, they've established uh, uh, tribal or, co or so-called, I mean, community businesses worth billions of them, where the beneficiaries or the, of those of those or the partners in those who are ordinary residents know nothing about them. Just to make an illustration, I mean, when you say when, when the Bafgan chief is selling platinum stars, platinum stars that he bought through the the the, the, the money, I mean, through the community coffers. I mean, who gets consulted when such things happen? Who decides that, that, that the best option or the best way to use money is infrastructure, building so, a soccer sta a sporting stadium in Murulang or a sporting stadium in Gang? Who decides that? I mean, so these are things that you find that people on the ground are very much against. Right. Now, what I argue here again in the second, so how much time do I still have? Uh, Oh, okay. Thank you. Because if I speak for long, people will sleep. Okay. Now, I argue also that distributive struggles on the platinum belt also epitomize contestation and competing meanings that act as attached to land and mineral wealth in South Africa. You know, I mean, we, we, it's now well established that generally people do not benefit from mining. Mining doesn't attract, I mean, doesn't uh, doesn't create jobs for, for, for local I mean, and, and other forms of of, of of benefits are not accrued. Particularly the, the, the mining revenue, mining revenues that some of the traditional authorities have managed to secure. Also, I need to to, to remind those who are not be aware that how do particular chiefs or traditional authorities 
attempt to uh, acquire to amass wealth, I mean, wealth, wealth, I mean, billions of them. When said the last time I heard, I don't know whether the generals are but no one ever know the exact figures. Figures were almost 20 billion right, which are the right. I mean, I mean the last time I checked, it was almost 40 billion. You know? So, I mean, these this, this are money, you know, not just uh, chips. So, when you're talking about that, I need also to, to, to remind you or make you aware that land that was um, identified or purchased as tribal property in the manner that I talked about, right? Where independent purchasers had to register their, their land in the, uh, in the name of the tribe. Because this is what we used to happen. Africans dispossessed of land and will come together as farmers and contribute. I mean, uh, and, and, and raise money to purchase the farm. But before they could purchase the farm, they used to look, look for a recognized chiefs. And the Mafian and Bahada chiefs were the, the recognized chiefs in Finanza. They knew which lawyer they could go to to, 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 to get the transfer. They knew how to negotiate with the, with the officials. But of course, in their process, they became immensely wealthy. They had farms themselves and, and, town, and, 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 and township houses where it is in, in places where blacks were allowed to own them. Like in Lady Selborn. So, what is Lady Selborn today? Okay. Oh, no. Okay, I mean, but there's a place that it is because it's so good for some of the children who own properties there and rent. But so, if you look at at, at such a, a pattern, then they then eventually that tribal land, when I mean, when it was going to be rich in the past, then most of the companies that were extracting that land started paying. Royalties. <coughs> Royalty is a rent for mineral resources. For mineral. When mineral resources were still property, why do I mean by like that? Because minerals were nationalized, right? Under the new India Union and this was mentioned. So that was in the early 2000s. So which meant that, that I mean, that, remember when you purchase land, you would purchase the land. Satisfying, then you get also a title bit for the minerals underneath, like different titles. But most land that was purchased by Africans, if it was not that the land was purchased by Africans, mineral rights would not be sold. So that is one thing that, that used to happen. Or if there were mineral rights, they would, they would be coerced to sell the mineral rights or be given alternative land if they don't want to. So that, that's one of the. But now some of the land was acquired. During the early period, that is late 1850, right? During the early 1850s, through missionaries, some of the land still had mineral rights attached to them. So in the 1960s and 70s, when some of the prominent uh, mining companies were attracted to, to mine platinum in these areas, they started paying some form of royalties to travel authorities. But that money was never kept, I mean, it didn't come directly to you know, traditional council or tribal council, that money went to one of so I, I don't know which which account, I mean, before, but in the 1970s, it went to what was called then, uh, what, what did they call it? That was, uh, but it was an account that was kept by Chief Mango. It was the account, the development account. So it, it was a huge book. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then it's inherited. I, mean, I think you have known, I mean, three of us were dealing with this, right? Some of you might know. <coughs> and most of that money disappeared in the thin air. Politicians squandered it. I mean, check, check. I mean, Jimmy Tuma does a lot of, I mean, a report about that. I mean, before she, just, just before she left, submitted that report, before she left her office. On one community, well, some of the, some of the money cannot be traced. But on one community, Bahama Bukhari, who had hundreds of, of millions, ended up with less than one. I don't want to go the wrong figure. But far less than 100 million. Far less than 100 million. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's what you, you, you would get. And they're still fighting for that money, trying to know where the money goes. But there was collusion between the chiefs and, 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 and the current government. So then, now, in the early 2000s as well, these communities were encouraged when, 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 when the old order old, 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 old rights disappeared, when minerals were nationalized, they were encouraged to convert their. Uh, their, I mean, their, their, their the rent they were getting from the to into equity 
into, into equity shares within the companies that are operating in, in, in their areas. So now, if you convert royalty to equity, meaning that you're a partner in the business, right? You are no longer acquiring rent. Um, I mean, for instance, if, if, if I uh, rent this space to Rhodes University, <coughs> then I'm the owner of this space. So at any point, in time, whether they were students, whether they <coughs> Rhodes University utilized this or not, but at the end of the month, I'm still getting my rent, right? But now, if I'm a partner with the university, right, then if the university I mean, was a company that was not doing anywhere and was not doing well anymore, no more students want to come to the university, they're not getting money, whatever. So then I suffer as well, I don't get my, my share, my dividend. You understand what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. So if you see now, I mean, now that, for instance, the platinum prices, the collapse, the global collapse of, of, of platinum prices have really affected these traditional authorities because they're no longer getting any, uh, any shares. Uh, any dividends for because they're now they, they are partners in, with mining companies, they're no longer owners of surface uh, surface rights or if, if even mineral rights because mineral rights are no longer property from which you can extract rent. Now, coming back to my discussion, <coughs> so I'm, I'm just going to, 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 to go through that quickly. You know, I mean, now I, I, I draw on various studies that conceptualize rural land and natural resource struggles. As contestation over meaning. And I argue that mining land dispossession reveals not only the vulnerability of land tenure rights on the platinum belt, but the shifting meanings from below. Dominant meanings of land are contested and always unstable. I also argue that the historical patterns of access to control and exclusion from, from resources emanate from and in turn mold completing meanings and cultural understanding of rights. Uh, property relations and entitlement. Uh, and, and then I use an approach which advocates a historical perspective uh, and also highlights the value of social memory. Now I, I draw on two villages as I, as, as I have indicated. I, I mean, I think I maybe I've mentioned I mean, this study was largely drawn on detailed land history study. And uh, group interviews and archival research. Now I followed land claims in two villages, historical, you know, and observed a particular interesting pattern that both properties that were being contested were talking about mineral rich farms in both villages, the village of Sefidile and the village of Disappear, under. There's a particular part um, uh, of one claims of a mineral rich farm, ex- exclusive claim by groups within the village. And of course, these claims are attributed uh, through the uh, diverse histories. The groups claiming men have a clear attribution of their history as descendants or beneficiaries, whatever term they call themselves. Descendants of the original purchasers of land. For instance, in Safidile, they, they claim to be descendants of the 52 families that contributed money, uh, cattle, and other resources to acquire a property called Spitzkopf. Spitzkopf was not particularly uh, fertile, but we knew. Of course, remember, land that was purchased by Africa would be very if it is, if it, 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 it fits the criteria of being, of being given to others. One of the criteria was that there was no sufficient water, it was arid, and of, of, and of course, some, some missionaries would, I mean, the government archives would try to dig the that land if they were, would, they wanted to stay in the community and, you know, and proselytize and, 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 and be, go to the people. So they would say the land is not from the end of the they would try to do that, you know, that. Of course, the land is suited for native occupation. There is that thing. It's not good enough. There's not enough water. Blah, blah, blah. And it's not good for it. So I think it could be. So, but it's very rich in plastic. Uh, I'm past, or I'm an Anglo American, who was called J.C. Watt. Does anyone remember? Johannes is in business. Investments. Investments. Yeah, it was J.C.R. So, 
at a time. It started in the late 1930s. And I think in the early 1940s, the government has started. I mean, that, that's how long they've been on that way. And they're still there today. I mean, today, Anglo has just, I mean, I mean of course, it's not like when they unbundled their assets in 1995. Anglo has had to be all the way. in 1995, then Anglo has had all the assets. But they only sold that asset, the part, I mean, in, in last year. So, now, of course, because they are, because of the labor unrest and because they are, they are moving to more lucrative open cast um, mines that, that, that do not necessarily require labor uh, machinery in the global, which is the, the Mukaraguna mine, is their main asset now. So they, they've given up, I mean, on the, uh, they've sold most of their rusting assets. So this is, I mean, where the union mine is in, 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 in Safigina, in a in the Swiss court. And then the, the other place is the Fed, also claims Virgo Strait. A very fertile, fairly fertile piece of land which was largely compounded by what used to happen was that when people settled in a mature area, they would try to put together uh, resources to purchase land that they could use to survive. Most of these people were resilient farmers. One thing I noticed is that there has been over the years a history of institutions that allowed Africans to share uh, land, to share property rights, to outside. Remember, like I, I indicated in especially in land, people were removed from elsewhere and down to the area. So there are some very special authorities that have a very good clan system that, that assimilates people into their clan, into membership of their clan. That's why I find people being members of one clan, but with different settings so together. You can still find some of the uh sending, some of the persons who or cross out or some I don't know the better sendings within within one clan. You know, I mean, but because of that system. So they would also allow people who are non buyers of the land. I mean who are not or is part of the original that they're coming from outside. Some of them true relations, some of them married to the family, and demarcated pieces of land for them. And there was very limited involvement of ships, ships once these properties were purchased. I mean, in particular way, in terms of demarcating land rights or deciding on who occupies what. So the families of the purchasers would, most of the time, um, have power to, to demarcate land to wherever they wanted to. Land to, to those institutions. <coughs> of course, I do not say that these were the entire institutions. Quite often, you see, I mean, you observe some of the different people that you know, particularly when, uh, when now that land is, 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 is controlled by cities, <laughs> cities getting land to mine. People are starting to articulate um, some of the histories that were never that domain. Because people who were, who were allocated land were not the descendants of the original buyer, they could transfer those rights to their children from generation to generation. So no one raised the question that your father was never a member <coughs> of the original buying scheme. But now this came through one phenomenon, I mean, which is quite dominant, claim over title. I, 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 I touched on that in the paper quite a lot. What does claim over title mean? Yeah, and this is what I, I, I get to later on. Because in both communities or villages, the groups that are claiming these lands have applied, I and mean, they've done a, a, a lot of other measures, but one of the dominant ones is to apply for land type, type of adjustment. There's an act called Land Type of Adjustment Act of 1993. So both of them have applied for them, and both of them have taken the chips to court to say, we are the original. By so the original owner, owners, these were owners of the land. The chief does not have power over this land. This land was part of our forefathers. And this has been taken to the highest cost of the land. Some of these people I know have even sold uh, their cattle to pursue these cases. They have lost some of the resources to be, because I mean, they are fighting against the chief who owns billions of land. 
all of the communication numbers. So he's using that line to fight against the people who are resisting him, right? So now, and, and then when you look at that pattern, so and but they're still continuing with this. And even now, some of these communities, I mean, they 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 are challenging. There's still some of these cases going on. So, but these cases, I mean, these claims are very exclusive. They are focused on group groups that purchase them. So all other institutions that have existed through different historical moments, I mean, which I'm not going to get for now, have since, by these groups at least, been abandoned. And there's exclusive claims to private property by these particular the descendants of this particular group. In this attempt, they are taking clients, they are descendants of taking clients who were the original buyers of the farm in the first place. Where pyramids like that now mine, owned largely by a man called Brian Gilbertson. Not a very favorable man in the mining industry, believe me. That means that means is not a good name at all. So but I'm not going to go in there. So but if you not then if you notice the pattern that have before emerged is that most of these things <coughs> and it has sort of created tensions within the villages because the people <coughs> who were regarded so those people who were regarded as 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 as, as descendants of non buyers have now been displaced in this place. For instance, when they were required to submit family histories to show where they come from. I mean, most of the people were displaced. They were said, I mean, they were not the original buyers, so they couldn't uh, share it, 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 could be regarded, it could be regarded as beneficial. Now, in, in conclusion, I'll just raise a few issues. Now, I mean, of course, it is well known that a distributive conflict over land varies, and so do land tenure. Regimes. So, I mean, we wouldn't find, I wouldn't, I'm not saying here, I mean, that this is a particular, a, 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 a peculiar or something new that has not been said. I mean, you wouldn't expect particular forms of, of conflict or, 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 or to occur uniformly in different places. But games over land, uh, now, from what I'm observing, are exclusive. While the histories point towards a more inclusive patterns of, uh, of land holding. Why is the emergence of exclusive aims? I argue that the extent of my of dispossession, of course, I, I, I said, I indicated either that these are spaces of multiple layers of dispossession, and mining is adding another form of dispossession. And people have responded differently at times. But now it seems as if this is the final layer where people are losing basically everything to the chief. And then I, I also argue that mining has created a, a massive uh, surplus uh, population, for instance, because Capital that now, as you can see, there's more emphasis on, on machinery in the mines, and a lot of young people who are hopeful to get into, or maybe ordinary people want to, who thought that mining would bring jobs. That is not happening at this stage. So that is also causing much more tensions and, 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 and resistance, I mean, at, at, at a local level. And now, if chiefly accumulated, I mean, accumulation is rooted on the chief's claims to, oh, to, to private communal claims. When I say private, you know, that this is a privately Bakata, uh, 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 claim or ownership of, of land and mineral rights. And so as such, chiefs are, are, are custodians. Then that is why now groups are starting also to show a pattern of claiming the title to land because private ownership, it is, it seems to be, uh, empowering. The, the, um, at least the local elite at, at the level of the of, of, of the traditional authority. Uh, private claims not only about uh, I argue that private, private claims are not only about exclusive group benefit, but but also about <coughs> removing control uh, of chiefs uh, on over land and mining revenues. So I mean I have asked the two questions as well. What does this mean? I mean maybe some of you are going to ask. Where does this take us then? Particularly when we are talking about, I mean, in the current, uh, around the current debates on land. But I want us to, I think I've raised this question earlier on as well, that we need to also understand that throughout history, there's been 
a total uh, overlooking or undermining of African land holding systems. And Africans have had, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, given its unparalleled form of dispossession, where Africans were basically left landless. There have been an overlook of African land holding systems. As, 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 and as such, it, it, it is then any policy that is focusing on land have not really touched on the complexities of social relations, of social relations of a property, particularly land in the former homeland areas. Thank you. Thanks very much for all that. Also, I see you've done the drive from London, Ghana, everything. So, oh. it's a good idea. Okay, well, I'd like to just um, open up for a few questions. I mean, I think this does show when we talked about the labor study seminar series, it's more than just looking at Kasaji. Not that Kasaji is not important. But for understanding labor in a, in a broader, broader way, yes. we're looking at issues around about class. And I think this complicates how we think about class. <coughs> often I think our, our that, if we talk about WMC and wiping off the or, or private capital, that's important. We think about the big politicians and that. But there's this whole other mm. thing. And our urban focus, I think, is often blinding us to this mm. third pillar of power in society. I think it's also pointing to that the land question isn't just about percentages of ownership, but mm. about the social relations and the forms of ownership and power that go with those. Um, if you have a land reform program that doesn't deal with agrarian social relations, mm. you can simply replace, reproduce, and recreate new forms of elitism and exclusion. So thanks. Sir. This is great stuff. I want to make two announcements. The one is, if you're from sociology, there should be a register floating around. And then what we do with all of these is people who may be new here, we want to ask you just to sign here and we can add you to our direct mailing list. For example, that's the list through which we will distribute the paper. So if you haven't previously come, welcome. And if you can add your details, we can add you onto that and we can provide the paper tomorrow. Let's take a few questions, maybe take a round, maybe the prof respond, take a round. Um, I just want to find out just a few questions. I wanted to make a um, So I wanted to know, <clears throat> uh, in the abstract, you know, there is a mention of ethnographic study that is done. I just wanted to know, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to ask, but what kinds of things do you actually do um, in order to gather the data? And the last one is, uh, how exactly is it that people do not end up getting job opportunities in these mines? That's what I want to know. Hmm. Should I take that one or I think it's okay. take two more and then you can have a bundle? Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for the paper, it was really interesting. I'd like to know like um what is your response on uh, the fact that people pay cash instead of being reset of on the land? And are you familiar with the Papuana land trade? Which is like a Indianist book where they claim the entire southern half of Johannesburg, the whole area. Because there is like a few places that people don't want to go. Let's go to the Okay, uh, thank you colleagues for the interesting questions. Um, hope they are clear. Why did I do? Uh, I, I mean, I began in 2007, I mean, this was part of my PhD. I've employed different methods and at different uh, times. But I, I mean, I've collected, uh, well, I think a couple of hundred now of in-depth interviews with ordinary residents, members and leaders of 
village-based movements, elders. I mean, then I, I did detailed love histories, starting from 2013, of uh, the, the claimants, ordinary villagers and groups that are reclaiming land. And uh, I coupled that with detailed archival research on specific properties, farms that were being claimed, court cases, uh, records, um, dating back and looking at whether there has been any dispute pertaining to that particular land. And I've also been very much part of, um, very much immense part of whatever was going on during chieftaincy disputes, during the court disputes, uh, I mean, as an observer, by the state, I mean, even, even just attending sporting matches in the stadium, attending funerals, weddings. I mean, I've been very much part of the, the research. I mean, I've, I've spent uh, different amounts of time, depending on resources. But lately, I've been, because I've, I've been part of fairly well-funded research projects and, and raised some money to, to do. I'm still <coughs> continuing with the, with the research anyway uh, from, from here. But I do travel to spend a week or so. But in the past, I used to spend three months two months in, in, in the field. Yeah, so I don't know whether I've answered that. Well, oh, yeah, and, and we have also, in, in Limbobo, we have done quite a substantial survey looking at, on livelihoods, I mean, with the help of one of the colleagues that has joined our project when we when were still based in the swap, was very good on, on survey research. So, I mean, we've, we've done that only in one case, I mean, to corroborate, to look at them. Uh, the history to the capture attentions of, of live nodes and, and diversity of live nodes in a couple of villages in Mokopane area. But if you have the mind is, is really not okay, coming to your second question, is really not employing people. I mean this is a highly mechanized Mohala Gwena mine who is the main asset of Ampas and it's the one that is making more profit than if, in fact it is poised to become the most productive mine in the world. Uh, and lucrative mine in the world. And it employs just, ab just above a thousand employees, all highly skilled and, and not residing in the villages that are massively impoverished. And some of them are forcefully removed. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you, I mean, I, 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 I look at that, I mean, because mainly because now there has been significant focus on Less labor intensive mines. You know, I mean, the, most of the, the, particularly the mining companies now are looking for, I mean, but we are in the build up from the, 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 I mean, so 2012 onwards, the, the labor disputes. I mean, many of the big players don't want to be uh, involved in labor disputes or dealing with, with militant labor. You know, I, mean, I think they are also threatened by AMCO as well. Somehow, I mean, I, feel, I don't know. So, of course, they know they, they have not done any justice to it. Of course, there's this, also this question of 50 kilometer radius uh, that people from those so called affected com communities, sorry, should be employed in the mine. That has not really happened. Because what has happened, there are a lot of other issues that have been involved. Because chiefs want people who are ethnically Bahada to be employed, or Bafrian to be employed. And then there are a lot of other migrant job seekers. Then, then there's a fight between the, the, the ANC councillor. Or on the ground, or, or the the local municipal councillor and the, and the chief. Well, local municipal councillor, if I'm living in the area, can give me a proof of residence to say I'm local. And uh, but the, the chief won't give a Mwana uh, because I mean, my surname doesn't really reflect. So my surname. So those are some of the things that you look at. So basically, mines are not keen to to, to create employment currently. And something there has to be more redistributive distributive measures that are pursued to force the mines to. To to, 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 to to distribute wealth to all the investors. Then um, I'm not very. I mean, I, I think I think we're talking about the the, the 2014 where scenario where that where Zuma, I mean where, where the, the the claims had been opened at that during that window. No, it's not the window period. It was presented last year, um, 2016, February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's not the window period. Um, because it is like the entire southern part of Jennifer, it, it includes like the areas of South Africa, mm. like up until the Isle of Africa. Like, oh, really? Yeah, yes. Like no. The whole area, like, I, 
I've been reading a lot. Yeah, I've been reading a lot. I mean, of media stuff on that, but on on different chief. I mean, claims that I claim true chiefly identity. Mm-hmm. You know, because Zuma encouraged chiefs to claim land. Uh, you know, uh, on behalf of the people, which I find very problematic anyway. So I'm not. I'm, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not familiar in detail about the details of that, but I do, from my knowledge, that the uh, the land claims have been put on hold for now. I mean, after they were opened in 2015, in 20, in 2014. So I don't think there will be any because there's huge. But I mean, there was there were more than how many that were submitted? One thousand. I mean, thousands were submitted within no time. You know, so uh, and, and then there was a huge backlog as well. So the. I think that the whole question of, of restitution is, is very problematic as it stands now, but I'm not familiar with that. Yes. Now, how do we conceptualize state capital and communities and other stakeholders? Right, I've, I've made this suggestion as well, even to the high level panel on, 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 on particularly focusing on, on land and, and, uh, and spatial inequality. That the MP, the MPRD, Minerals and Proterium Development Act, MPRDA, uh, made mention of communities very vaguely. You know, we, we talk about communities as groups that have lived in land and, 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 and have had a strong, um, I mean, customer dreams and whatsoever. But this, this definition is, keep changing. One, we have to understand the social context and we have to use the IPIRA, the, the, the interim protection of, 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 of what? IPIRA, interim protection of property, eh? informal property rights, to defend the rights of, uh, 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 the land rights of the poor, right? To, to recognize them first as the owners of customer land rights, right? So that means they would be consulted. Interim protection and formal land rights. Yeah, in terms of the land rights. We use that, 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 that not, it should not be interim anyway. It should be more permanent now because that it was meant to be interim, but if it's been re- every year, it, 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 it has to be gazetted for quite, I mean, to, to be gazetted and, and put in, in, in action. Most of the time, the ministers forget to promulgate it. And then when people take, uh, I mean, when people are losing land and they take uh, the mining companies to court, the means of the, oh, I didn't know the concept of this year, you know. Because then the, so it has to be done in that, in that act that protects all informal land rights, customary and otherwise. So even people who are living in, 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 in the so called informal settlement areas. So now, if you recognize customary land holders as not as a stakeholder, as owners of land, then I think that the compensation and consultation could be grounded on that. Then other so called stakeholders. Will then at least engage with ordinary, with, I mean, with ordinary people in rural areas at a more, on a, on a more equal foot. You know, it can't be that the state owns the land. So, like all this, I mean, whether you're applying here, I mean, I've seen massive disruptions in the border where people are even starting to plow dust outside the fences of the mine. They will give the people who have survived through agrarian livelihoods and other forms of livelihoods. The mechanisms that we know this for a very long time. Okay, we all know that uh, this is the third is also a very interesting situation. They actually don't understand how that's how to reach out to the government. So, here, before I came here, I started picking one or two, and just looking at it and saying that the fate of the ANC's government to basically keep them.
as the lesson of his behavior was to be there, before the chiefs own this land, which is all the very different land. So when we use section 25, which history do you look to? The chief's history or the one pre-colonial before the apartheid and colonialism came in terms of things. So can the state really afford to take back the land without a very discussion, seeing that the lawyers are doing that, the fact that the ANC has been to take the land so that they allow crowd, their own grounds to allow the prosecution? Yes, um, so I was quite interested in your presentation um, because you're looking at how mining companies and the whole structure of capitalism interacts with communities, particularly in North West and in, in, in Limpopo. So I wanted to ask you particularly about Limpopo, and I find it interesting when you talk about Limpopo because that's not deep Limpopo. But <laughs> do, have you looked at research on the copper mines in Limpopo? In around Palabora, you know those areas. I mean, that's a, a, a you know. Have you looked at copper mines in that area, and 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 do a similar kind of study? And I'm also just curious to know if if maybe platinum <coughs> is unique in that it's been thriving. and we know in the global economy, mm -hmm. as we as we mentioned, and perhaps copper has been in decline. Yes. So I'm actually quite interested to know about just the impact of copper on those communities there in Limpopo and also the continued viability and therefore benefits of those um, mm. communities. So, okay. Lots, lots. Okay, sure. Can I take, okay. I'm just going to take a few quick. Okay. Before I forget, it's been circulating some of that. This is very complicated. Okay, stop. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Enjoy the presentation. Um, I just want to know sort of your opinion, uh, given now we have a new president of you know, democracy and he's got a quite a big mining focus as his mm -hmm. sort of primary drive for mm -hmm. creating jobs, but then in your presentation that you said that's there's been a shift towards capital intensity. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to know what is the your take on like is there potential for reform? Is there any viability in what mm -hmm. uh President Soro was his uh, sort of economic outlook per se? Uh, do you think the reform will address the challenges that you have outlined, or I mean, what is the prospect of reform more, more or less? Mm. Yeah. One, one more to that. I yeah. think if there's any other last questions, let's drop them in here. Because I think I don't know if we'll have time for another round. Okay. <coughs> so, um, and, then, and then I'll take the number five, which is five. Yeah. My question relates to when we are talking about uh, the people who are making the claim as the original. Like they were depending on the party, like they were the, um, mm, descendants. Yeah. Yes. Um, what about the number of people that live in those areas? How yes. long does one have to live in that area in order to become, uh, <coughs> and also to be part of the. Mm. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Can I, can I go on that? Okay. Uh, interesting questions, uh, and, and perhaps difficult ones, some of them, because I, well, can state afford um, uh, compensation, that's what you're saying. If, for instance, advocate, I, uh, I told me, an expert of law says that, I mean, the constitution is there. I mean, we could do this. Why? Remove checks into fights. That's what you're saying, right? That's what you say. He says. I'm not saying he says. I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you have seen him. You have read what he said. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so look, I, 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 I wouldn't. No, I think a legal scholar like Mugai Toby would expand better on that question. But, uh, well, as a sociologist, whether you remove section 25 or not, you know, I mean, which I, I, I do think that if it is prohibited <laughs> to giving land to people, it ought to be, should have been removed in 1991, in 1994, or 6, whatever. Because I do not know why people fear that, uh, I mean, if, if you remove if you give property, I mean, I mean, or land to historical marginalized black people, 
then there they, they would be chaos. We, we, we have lived so long in an unequal society and an unjust society to now believe, even our leaders, that uh, correcting those wrongs will be unjust. If you look at the history of how the history of dispossession in South Africa, and systematically, then the policies that were put in place to make sure that there is no entry of victim to any form of, of, of property where there is any. You know? I mean, look at our uh, urban special patterns now. Even now, the state still builds, construct houses for black people far away from the city center. And these people don't have money to travel every day. Do you see what I'm talking about? And the employers don't incentivize them to travel long distances. I know, for instance, in East London, people who are living in Daniel Village were removed to chicken farm, some of them. Chicken farm, far, how far is it from? About 30 cases of chicken farm. You know, they were living, they could walk, they could walk to work. You know, and they pay on average 50 rand a day. And most of these people, Workers, domestic workers, and those who are lucky enough to find jobs. Workers, domestic workers, uh, workers, gardeners. I mean, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the forms of injustice that we have to observe every day. To the point that it shouldn't have happened. Because, I mean, there are two things that are always conflicted here. Conflicted here. You know? The big estate wide commercial agriculture is not the best way to go. Because most of us may be service line power, by the way. The farmer can use what he can use, I mean, he alone, and most of the land is not even used. Why not put, I mean, also integrate, especially in areas that are better, support smallholder and middleholders, I mean, middleholder access to black farmers, imagine black farmers, support them currently with both knowledge, skills, and money. You know? Because, I mean, uh, we're not, I mean, especially in areas where there's sufficient rainfall, in areas where the, I mean, the, that is good, for, good land, why do that to go to school? And then dismantle the homeland system altogether. Because homeland are still homeless today. <laughs> Give people land outside the homeland. <laughs> there, are people, there could be people living in, in, in Tanzania who want to be farmers, right? You can't say to me because. I'm, I'm in the village of Nama with them. Uh, I, I, I'm more qualified with a farmer than a fellow who grows in Tanzania. It's all about it. I may not want to be a farmer. In fact, I may want to own a property in the city because I want my children to land in the city. You know what I'm So we can't just be talking about road. You know, I'm going to get to scared about this because we are not unpacked as we come together. Even the constitution, I mean, we have not even touched the, I mean, which I always say, we have not even touched. The pre colonial African lens COVID system. Because I think they were never again, they were never bad. Because we talk about pre colonial African lens system, we talk about the power. I mean, I'm so sorry, I'm very interested in what power people have over property. You may find, for instance, if we, now, if you see a small boy, uh, I mean, behind the head the of Kelvin, ask, Zes Gabanes go. He will not say that one belongs to my uncle, that one belongs to my aunt. He will say, Zesa, <coughs> meaning that there are multiple layers. Or, or, or power, there are multiple layers of power over that property. You see what I'm talking about? If you look at the plowing field, he will say, You see what I'm talking about? He will say, You see what I'm talking about? He will say, you see what I'm talking about? This belongs to a particular productive unit with each member having power over. I mean, of course, the power may not be, may, may not be egalitarian, right? May not be equal. You may find that within that productive unit, there are people who have power to allocate. I mean, just to those what I say, you can plow, you, you, you see what I'm talking about. But, but you see that, but we, this is the thing we're not talking about. When we talk about, we don't talk about broad, you know, a, a territory that belongs to a traditional authority state. But I'm not doing that, but I'm anyway, that was the point. But secondly, copper mines in the bubble. What, what number are, are, you, are you doing um, a postgraduate study? Yes, definitely. I, 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 think, <laughs> I think you have just clarified a nice topic. To pursue, but for you. <laughs> no, but look, I've not looked at this, but uh, um, I've only looked at the Mokopane part of Limpopo. 
and, and, and Gegan, you know, where the Ivanhoe mine is. And I'm interested, I mean, to share ideas and with you when other people on how, for instance, I mean, even collaborate with people who are interested in, in, in pursuing this research. Because still, I mean, towns like Palahoro, for example, mm. exist because of the copper mines. Mm, so, mm. I mean, it's a huge significant uh, in that area. Exactly. And, and have a look at the history of the copper mining in the Karoo. I mean, so, I mean, we can talk, I mean, look, okay, we can talk more about that. But anyway, I'm very, I mean, I would be very interested to learn more about this from you. I don't know a thing about it. Uh, then, the new president, potential for reform? Another difficult question. <laughs> An extremely difficult question. And maybe a political analyst, those people. <laughs> I'm saying those people, sometimes they have it. They are, they annoy me a bit, but they can, they can answer maybe that question, you know. Uh, but for, 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 for a researcher, sociologist like me, I'm very, I've learned now to, 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 to be careful about what I, I know and what I don't know. Because the more you study, the best, the best thing you learn is to, is what you do not know. That is, in fact, that you know very little. I don't know if this fellow, uh, Ramaphosa, we had a, 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 a great potential to bring about a, a, a reform. And uh, I mean, I can talk, I can throw an opinion of my own. I mean, look, he, he doesn't have a good history in mining, particularly in the, the type of topics that I've raised. Mm -hmm. But now it's a watch and see scenario. Uh, it, I think we have been following the mining charter case. I mean, that it has been put on hold. And Mandata said that there, there, there would be a, a trimmer to consult the communities. I mean, communities have consulted. Mandata said that there will be, I mean, this will be done in a three months. So what we're trying to do, I mean, working with some of the communities, is to, add, uh, is to argue that there is too little a time to get the voice of the community on the ground, you know, to, to look across. Mining charter is one instrument that could be used to benefit communities. Well, so, I mean, those are some of the debates we're doing. But I wouldn't be sure. I wouldn't know if Ramaphosa, where he stands. He has not raised his head yet. Maybe, maybe the Margana incident, uh, the Margana history has, has made him to change his mind a bit towards the people we shall see. Original claimants, how long does it take? I like that question. I mean, I can answer that question. Uh, th I mean, this is exactly the crux of my second argument that I'm trying to say. That the new meanings are more exclusive. Because historically, people have included people on their land, accommodated people who are landless and destitute during the critical moments. But why now are they pushing out? And this is causing more and more tension on the ground, you know. And this is something that is not uh, is not understood when we talk about people are still talking about host communities, mining communities. But we're talking about very complex social relations on the ground, you know, and the social context on the ground. So I mean, this is I mean, for instance, the emergence of the original or original claimants and bias has arisen out of the out of people's resistance to the control of revenues by chiefs and the fact that they're not benefiting. And they see the exclusive benefit by the local uh, tribal elite as, in, in my view, a way in which they could also make their, their strong claims, you know, and assert that actually to displace the power of the chiefs. I and mean, just to also to, to engage directly with mining capital. But people who have been uh, using those, I mean, they have been part of that land or, or also have customer rights, I would argue with that. I would, I mean, I wouldn't say, I mean, they've lived, I mean, I mean, after how long, but I mean, because what is happening when one affiliates through those institutions? You affiliate with a cow, I mean, and you are a member of the community fully, you benefit from anything, you see what I'm about? And then you get introduced, I think, in the past to, to, to a local, I mean, to a local, um, uh, I don't want to use the head, to a local donor, or the donor, to a headman, it's something I don't know why, where the computers get that. <laughs> and then someone would, who is assimilating to the claim would vouch for that Nora is a man in good standing and he stands to contribute to our, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to our community. And he will be part of my clan. Do you see what I'm talking about? Part of, then the elder, then you, you are now part of the community. Then you fully in the land, you raise whatever, no one ever raises the question. Your children intermarry, you, you do not know about. But now, why do 
this institution collapse. You know, uh, 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 particularly when, when, when the so called, I mean, values of land increase all the land is happening for mining. So, this is what I'm trying to, the question that, uh, that I'm trying to, to engage in that way. Okay, there was a last thing there. It's, just, it's up to you if you want to. Yeah, for oh, okay, yeah, I'm for the, the previous one. Just the value of the land. Uh, hmm. now, the really interesting thing here is that the land, mining. Land, so actually, land and land is bad, not the minerals, right? So, if you're going to determine fair compensation for the mines, it's, very, it's a very interesting question about the power to appropriate the mine. Mm. Is it going to be to appropriate, not compensate for the mineral mines, compensate for the land and the mm. infrastructure? So, if you look at the crop, the way that land, that the land of the mine is bad, you must read it here. Mm. It's Tracy Lewis's work. She says, Actually, the land, the rates that these mines pay are for the same as farmers. Mm -hmm. the, the money actually goes to the central government. And that's part of the problem. It doesn't actually come to the local community. Mm -hmm. The royalties, but it's an interesting thing when it comes to redistribution, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. if the minerals are owned by the state already, so the, the, the land distribution thing is kind of complicated. The mm -hmm. mines are not as you imagine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, yeah, I think. I, I would. So this is a, a question I'm still thinking carefully about you know, as we speak because it comes to the question of now we act as if the state, the state, as institution, it is a new thing. <laughs> the state has always been there, and the state has never paid off the board. We are going to give land. Of course, I mean, this happens, right? We are going to give land to the state, right? Not to the people. This is not the Right? So the poor are going to give land. I mean, land, all land would be now no longer be property, right? I mean, if, if, if this nationalization is at a, a, a larger scale, as it is said to be, then we're going to give land to the state. But there's danger in unbidden state, you know. And uh, one of the areas that we're doing is suggesting that. For 25 years, you will have a list, right? Mm -hmm. Or well, imagine <laughs> investing or buying investing in a land for only for 25 years. And then I write an article that uh, that drew us out of life. Definitely, I won't have my, my land renewed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, that is not a small country, a small group of people. So, the state is not something that we have to observe very carefully. What is the state? If we are going to give all land, I and mean, we, we have been learned this, we have been learned this for a long, long time. Uh, I mean, we are since we are born, you know? And we still, even even those like here, even those like me, who have uh, said, no, when we are growing up, of course our parents were, were right in a way that we are stepped forward by, by, by being educated. But some of them will go on to say that, you will be rich and get it, get it. There's no such a thing. Believe me, what we have is a highly financialized uh, uh, economy where we are, the bank and the big financial institutions are giving us a lifestyle. Take, take one month pay from a black person, you will see them in the street. <laughs> so this is what happened. I mean, it's not like white people who have inherited from generation to generation property in the city. And when we came to the city, we had to rent. I mean, look at the, the grain cell here in the city, where if an employee by the rules or any academic, black like academic employee by the rules, would have to pay a rent to. I'm unlikely to pay a rent to a black person. So, but there are many people who like the majority are all around them. They are outside the, the markets, even as we speak. So, the whole thing of equality, the whole thing of creating wealth, was what we are talking about, we have spoken only about in income inequality. You cannot address wealth inequality by focusing on income inequality. Do you see what I'm talking about? If you die at my age with children, they will be as poor as your parents were. Because they will be landless, they will be house, the bank will take the house. You see what I'm talking about? Because the, nothing. So this is the thing that we need to be careful about. 
That's what we do about the question of men. That should have been resolved as in decades ago. Thanks.